So everyone, this is Monique Morrow, and uh, it's a pleasure to actually welcome you, everyone, our observers also, and participants, to this wonderful session on uh, disruptive technologies and cyber peace. Um, I'm very, very pleased to um, really be moderating this great session today with wonderful panelists uh, on behalf of the Cyber Peace Lab and on a topic around disruptive technologies and cyber peace. So here's what we're going to do, just to get our, our, our blood rolling in, in this particular discussion. I'm going to introduce our, our fantastic panelists. And what we're going to do is each panelist will have an opportunity to present 10 minutes of a point of view. And then we'll open up the questions and answers. And by the way, the questions and answers are going to be more about a fluid discussion on this topic. So we will have uh, Dr. Jean-Marc Rickley, and he is head of the Global Risks and Resilience Geneva Center for Security Studies. He will present it uh, from a point of view of the human impact. Each topic will be about how the human is uh, fits into this particular loop around disruptive technologies and, and cyber peace. Jean-Marc will be followed by Dr. Giacomo Persipaoli, who is a program lead for the United Nations Institute for um, Disarmament Research. And Dr. Pa um, Paoli will be talking about the change to human security. What does that mean from a human security perspective? And uh, he will be followed by um, Ms. Eleanor pa Powells. And, Ms. Powell's is really going to talk about AI and cybersecurity governance. I mean, in the, t in, the, in the terms of what are the challenges to human dignity? And recall, everything is around the human. Where does a human fit in this discussion? And last but not least, we will have uh, Professor Maria Rosaria Tadeo, who is representing the uh, Digital Ethics Lab uh, at the Oxford um, Internet Institute. And, Professor Tadeo will talk about the challenges in human equity. So let's get started. Let's start out with you, Jean-Marc, and your point of view. Thank you very much, Monique, and thank you for the Cyber Peace Institute for the invitation and for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with, in the panel with such a great lineup of uh, speakers. So um, what I will do in the next 10 minutes is just to highlight um, how technology is impacting uh, people. But before I start, just uh, want to give you a small vignette. You know, in 1982, a uh, KGB spy was arrested. Uh, Colonel Vladimir Vetrov, uh, codename um, Farewell, by the West. And what Vetrov did, uh, he was uh, frustrated by how the system was working in the Soviet Union. And so he decided to leak documents about uh, the spy network in the West on, on technology. And so what Farewell did was to provide the French DST uh, about 4,000 documents. These documents led to the arrest or about, of about 500 KGB spy and uh, people in the West that were cooperating with uh, the Soviet uh, Union. This leak uh, was also an opportunity for France to um, improve their relation with the United States when Mitterrand was elected because he had appointed a uh, communist uh, uh, minister. And so Reagan at the time when uh, um, Mitterrand gave him uh, this information, was thankful and uh, regained trust. That was in 1982, 4,000 documents. 30 years later, Edward Snowden uh, <laughs> leaked 1.2, 1.5, 1.7 million uh, documents. One man. And so uh, the what uh, the Snowden leaked in terms of information, notably information about how the NSA was cultivating zero days vulnerabilities. And a group in 2017, Shadow Broker, uh, stole uh, some of these uh, zero days vulnerabilities. One was called Eternal Blues, and that led to WannaCry and NotPetya to uh, attack the first one, a ransomware, the second one, a Viper, that led to massive uh, damage. On, of several billions uh, worldwide. 
Why am I telling you about that? Because in a matter of 30 years, uh, what we've seen is that the roles of individual has been magnified by the fact that digital technologies provides uh, states, uh, provides um, individuals with uh, power that they would never been able to think about a few years uh, uh, earlier. So uh, based on that, will that trend continue? Most likely, why? Because first of all, um, the more slow uh, tells you that computing power uh, doubles every 18 months. There have been some studies done in the, ro the, the role of uh, AI compute, and the doubling period is not 18 months, but three months and a half. And so that means that we are generating more and more powerful computer that individuals are able to use. And so this is both a, an opportunity for uh, individuals to matter, but also this represents some risk and threat. So uh, what are the, the type of technology that will have an impact on, uh, on the future? First, those technology that increase the speed at which um, a computer are able to um, to uh, to compute and here obviously we have quantum uh, computing but we have also neuromorphic computing that mimic how uh, neural uh, br uh, neural network uh, neuron uh, brain are uh, working and so here the impact will be on the tempo of uh, operation especially in the military but also in mundane tasks that are repetitive uh, computer uh, algorithm uh, will be able, uh, uh, for some, are already uh, able to perform tasks uh, much faster than a human being. And so here there is the risk of uh, human beings becoming uh, irrelevant in, for, for now at least, in tasks that are repetitive. Then there are uh, technologies that are improving autonomy, obviously uh, artificial uh, intelligence. And so, even though now AI has been hype, uh, we're still in the era of weak AI where most algorithms are only able to perform a task where they have been trained to. But uh, research is being conducted and what we start to see is that um, algorithms are, um, are uh, becoming more and more uh, autonomous. This is the holy grail of uh, research uh, in the field. And this will have tremendous impact in the weaponization, for instance, of, um, of, uh, of malware. Imagine, for instance, um, the proof of concept by uh, IBM Deblocker, where you have a, a malware equipped with a neural network. It can learn about an environment and then evade uh, defenses in order to strike its uh, targets. And so uh, we, we see also uh, in the field of uh, drone technology, loitering munition that are equipped increasingly with autonomous capabilities. And so the rise of autonomy creates true technological surrogate that could actually uh, be used against uh, a man's human being. Then there is the category of understanding what uh, humans are really good at and almost unique at doing, which is language. And here you have natural language uh, processing. You may have heard about uh, GPT-3, this algorithm that is able to generate test, uh, text by uh, learning and uh, having uh, 175 billion parameters in order to reproduce text. And here, uh, with improvement in the field, what we start to see is um, the giving an opportunity or growing room for uh, manipulation we could think in the future of true synthetic editor where uh, text could, would have been generated completely artificially by an algorithm. And here uh, there is the risk, obviously, of disinformation manipulation, uh, similar to what would happen with uh, deepfake. Deepfake, if you... Uh, 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 look at this technology was non-existent prior to 2014. The first video of deepfakes uh, were uh, found on the internet at the end of 2017. And now, uh, I might, you might have read this article uh, two weeks ago, a, um, a woman in Pennsylvania uh, created deepfakes of uh, the contender of her daughter's, uh, in the, the, her cheerleading uh, team, and she did fake videos of the, of 
the, this, uh, this woman naked or cursing in order to undermine the reputation so that her daughter could actually uh, join uh, the team. So you, you can see again an example where uh, the technology that was non-existent five years ago has democratized so rapidly and had been repurposed by some people in order to do harms. I just say another category of uh, technology that are very uh, of concern could also be uh, very much uh, good. These are immersive technologies uh, like augmented and virtual reality uh, that could have lots of potential benefits, but also uh, could uh, amplify the phenomenon that we've seen with social media and um, locking people in uh, information bubble, but if immersive technologies, this is not just Im um, uh, information bubble, but that would be a uh, space perception uh, bubble. And here, the gaming industry will play a very important role, and uh, more and more games will be immersive, and so this will have an impact on, for, for instance, the, how kids are uh, um, thinking about the world. And so here also an avenue for massive uh, manipulation. Robotics is another uh, instance. You might have remember end of the t uh, two ta 2000, we had robots that could barely uh, work. And now if you look at videos of Boston Dynamics, you suddenly have uh, robots that are able to do parkour, backflips, and this is per pretty scary. That uh, combined with autonomous technology, we start to see uh, things that were only in, uh, in movies with robots that are have the same range of motion than human beings are fully autonomous. Uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, some robots were used in hospital or, in a, or to uh, warn people in the streets to wear masks or uh, other information. Obviously, that leads uh, in uh, what we've seen so far uh, in the best result when it, when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine combining the two. And so human machine teaming is definitely something that is uh, high on the agenda of uh, most uh, states, but also companies, uh, because this is when we achieve uh, the best results. In the military, this has already some uh, doctrine, for instance, with the so-called uh, loyal wingman, the ability of a pilot to direct a swarm of, uh, of drones. The first uh, experiments were conducted uh, last year, but here this is just the beginning. And so if you push the rationale of human machine teaming, what you end up with is connecting uh, the human beings directly to the machine through the so-called brain-computer mm -hmm. interfaces. And here you have lots of uh, research that is being carried out. Fantastic application, for instance, in fighting trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. But if you're able to do that, you're also able to erase other types of uh, memory. So the last two things, uh, and I will conclude by that, is that these technology, first of all, they are converging. And so in the future, it will mean not, not just one uh, technology that is getting, going ahead, but these technology are uh, mutually self-reinforcing. And so we will develop some technologies that probably were not even aware of now, but that will combine, for instance, synthetic biology with artificial intelligence, and that will create a complete new uh, technological uh, development, but also completely new uh, threat and risk uh, to uh, human beings. And so with that, what we will see increasingly is the fusion of data. But the fusion of data, not just digital data, it will also be genetic data and brain data. So if you think about the impact that uh, social media had already on, uh, on people in terms of uh, manipulation of opinion, in terms of polarization and um, like creating groups that are longer to talking to each other just with digital data. Think about the consequences of the fusion of digital uh, brain data and genetic data. So uh, I will stop here, but as you can see, there are a lot <laughs> of possibilities for things to go right, but also things to go wrong, and we want to prevent that from oh, happening. Oh my, my goodness, we're on a tectonic shift here. Um, so si thank you very much, Jean-Marc, for actually setting up the discussion on human impact. I'm. I'm intrigued. Uh, at some point, we'll t have to talk about telepathy. Uh, so let's go to you, Dr. Uh, uh, Giacomo Paoli. What do you see in ter terms of challenges of human uh, security? Um, what are your thoughts here? Uh, you know, as we see that, because human security is a big topic, and you know, we tend to think about it from infrastructure perspective. Uh, I have read uh, some of your work around uh, swarming 
uh, technologies for good and swarming technologies that can go awry. So you have a few minutes here to, to set up that discussion. Okay, thank you. I'll, it's a challenge, but I'll try, I'll try to do <laughs> that. And uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this event. And thank you also to Jean-Marc for setting the scene so nicely. There will inevitably be a degree of overlap when it comes to the types of technologies that he mentioned and the types of technology that I will mention. But I'll try to focus more specifically on the concept of, of human security and potential risks. Now, for me, it is important that um, we uh, interpret uh, or we give risks the right the right meaning. Risks does not kind of exist on its own. It's always the result of at least three factors. One are the threats. Uh, the other one is the vulnerabilities, and the third one is the impact that a potential kind of a, a, a successful malicious action would have on on the the identified target or victim. And to me, it is important that we keep all of these three kind of concepts in mind because it's very difficult to overgeneralize the uh, risk uh, that new technologies bring to, to human security. Um, uh, Jean-Marc mentioned, uh, I'm going to try to go briefly in, you know, through all of these three categories. So Jean-Marc mentioned the, the concept of technological convergence, which I think for me uh, is, is very important um, because while in lab, or in development stages, many of these technologies are studied in isolation. When it comes to their fielding, uh, real-world applications are likely to be uh, uh, to happen in you know in, in combination. And uh, what type of convergence can we see from from what Jean-Marc said? There are at least two. One is convergence of different digital technologies that are. Uh, mutually reinforcing and, and supporting each other, and then convergence between uh, digital and, and, and physical technologies. And because the scope of this, of this uh, uh, event is all about the, the impact on cyberspace, they both have, uh, 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 you know, they're both relevant. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to explore one of the mostly kind of uh, discussed uh, examples of technological convergence, digital, convergence, which is between cyber and, and AI. Now, for those of you who are, uh, uh, who are familiar or, or not familiar with, with cyber attacks, um, no cyber attack is exactly identical as the other. However, there are some uh, uh, stages or steps through which uh, uh, each cyber attack kind of, or attacker has to go through in the preparation and, and delivery of this uh, uh, of the attack, and this ranges from the initial reconnaissance to the identification of vulnerabilities, the actual exploitation of the vulnerabilities, the conduct of whatever uh, malicious intent, whether it is, it is to steal data or to manipulate uh, data on the network, and trying to do you know some sort of exfiltration strategy uh, uh, as well. Now, all of these steps are. Uh, you know, AI can play a role in all of these steps. However, if we look at the, the let's say, the, the near term or the midterm between now and, and, and the next five years, it is unlikely to imagine of a, a synthetic agent that is able to run the entire process on its own without, without uh, uh, the intervention of humans. And by entire process, I mean, from the design of the attack strategy to the design of new malicious code or payload, the identification of vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. However, uh, and kind of following up on what Jean-Marc was saying, there are uh, already, uh, AI has been used to incrementally but significantly improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of each one of those steps. Uh, AI can be used to better identify vulnerabilities or patterns of behaviors in the selected target population, entry points. They can be used to formulate uh, and, cre and design uh, more realistic phishing emails, for example, or other types of, uh, uh, of traditional uh, attacks. It isn't until, you know, the probably the more than five to 10 years uh, uh, horizon that we can probably see uh, uh, synthetic agents, artificial intelligence operated agents that are able to run the entire, through the entire process 
by themselves. Um, and then there is the, the, you know, of course, this is always, if we look at the, the vulnerability side of it, we should also in, in, take a moment to reflect how societies have changed over, you know, the last two years and how increasingly reliant uh, we all are on, on the digital environment to pretty much uh, all, of, all about our business. Probably before COVID, you know, this event might have been uh, physical somewhere. Uh, so it's not only the, the kind of a, the economies and the business environment that has been uh, heavily impacted. If you remember the CEO of Microsoft in April last year said we've witnessed two years of digital transformation in two months. And mm -hmm. this was April last year. Imagine now. Um, so clearly it hasn't progressed at that same pace, but we are critically transforming the way the entire world operates. And this means that from a vulnerability perspective, the more humans are relying on digital devices, the more the, the vulnerable we, we all become with the blurring lines between uh, uh, the work environment, professional environment that where cyber physical defenses can be put in place, you know, air gapping between systems. Uh, all of these things are somehow becoming obsolete in, in an era where everyone is working from home. So this, these things have to be uh, uh, kept in mind. And uh, one area of convergence in the vulnerabilities uh, uh, kind of discourse is the area between advanced materials and, and digital. There is a lot of research that has been uh, uh, going on now around uh, miniaturization and digital. Uh, look up the concept of, of smart dust, which we're looking at creating connected part, you know, uh, devices that are so small that they're basically invisible to the human eye uh, and they're able to co you know, collect data, transmit it wirelessly somewhere else. Um, but also think about the, the advancements in, in smart uh, textiles and e-fabrics. All of these uh, uh, digital innovation are meant to make uh, uh, our kind of experience as humans and as users the, the more rewarding as possible, but at the same time, um, they open up a whole new range of potential uh, vulnerabilities and, and that could be exploited. And the last point I wanted to make, um, looking at the time, is about the issue of impact and how contextual that is. Now, mm -hmm. the concept of human security um, will really depend on, on, on where we are and, and, uh, and the context contextual factors. And I'm just going to bring one example. If we think about uh, a potential attack to uh, the digital banking infrastructure in uh, Europe will likely be very different from the same attack in Latin America or in Africa, where uh, the digital banking has, you know, has basically been uh, uh, one of the of the major trends uh, because of of the difficulty in having like a, a functioning infrastructure of physical banks. Digital banking has become the kind of a the the gold standard there so an impact that such an attack would have on, on human security is is very contextual dependent and of course i haven't touched on little autonomous weapon systems or swarms very happy to do that in the in the follow-up discussion thank you oh, definitely well thank you so very much uh, um dr paoli uh you've set it up in terms of what are the issues around human security and uh, there's a lot to to be discussed here specifically about how we're, our worlds are converging. Well, let's look at what it means to have a challenge in human dignity. And then the human dignity component here, um, Ms. Eleanor Powells will you know, give us a view, if you can and will, and I know you will, about what that means, because there's so much going on in, uh, when we're talking about AI and human dignity, the worlds are converging. Your background has been uh, a lot in the area around genomics and, and that play, but how do you see the, this world and where should, here's the most important part of this, where should the human play? So uh, up to you now, looking forward. 
Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be sharing insights with all of you today. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity. So one of the most significant legacies of the global crisis we face will be the way that the pandemic dovetails with another major global disruption, the convergence and democratization of AI and other dual use technologies. And both Jean-Marc and Giacomo have uh, alluded to this. So computer scientists are developing deep learning algorithms uh, that can recognize life patterns within massive amounts of population data. And at the same time, geneticists and neuroscientists are decoding data related to genomes and brain functioning. So learning about uh, what makes us human. The potential for advancing our condition, for a new symbiosis centered on optimizing human and biological life might simply be too powerful for us to refuse. Yet at the same time, this epistemic revolution embodies a new biopolitics where a knowledge and power asymmetries could seriously undermine a human agency and dignity. So I will cover two significant uh, challenges related to AI and tech convergence. First, in the short term, protecting populations from collective data and algorithmic harm. And then second, in the longer term, shaping the convergence of AI and life sciences, including neurotech and genomics, with the goal to preserve people's agency and dignity and promote a form of collective empowerment. Uh, so essentially, we need to learn to live uh, with dual use. So let me start with the near term impacts, with the threats to human dignity that are produced by a first level of convergence, what I call the internet of bodies and minds. Mm. So we have entered a, a new tech era where our private and collective human experience has become free material for behavioral surveillance. So our patterns of life, our emotions, physical and biological data can be turned into predictive insights to fuel epistemic and cyber conflicts. So let me articulate for you the technical assemblage, the combination of dual use technologies that are inc increasingly used uh, in conflict prone and fragile countries. So combined with techniques for sensing and data capture, AI systems can be designed to analyze demographic, biometric, facial, and to some extent emotion data about individuals and populations. And based on these training sets, algorithms can then learn to analyze and predict human actions and behaviors. And such uh, detection capacity is also used for crowd analysis, where AI can help predict crowd behaviors, uh, map social interactions or grouping in crowds, and flag atypical behaviors. In addition, access to large data sets captured through satellites and drones equipped with video surveillance can also reveal the location, settlements, and movements of refugees, minorities, and ethnic subgroups. So increasingly, a such form of behavioral surveillance could help states and non-state actors alike anticipate populations' movements during protests, elections, ceasefires, religious or social events to better enforce control or repression. And we have seen how the convergence of AI biometrics and techniques below the skin, based on facial, voice, gait, and DNA samples, is already used in China for profiling based on uh, subpopulations, ethnicity, and phenotype. In other regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, several countries also face a proliferation of technologies that make bodies and minds increasingly traceable. So for instance, uh, the AI software called iSentry used to detect abnormal behavior in the streets of Johannesburg, uh, mobile biometric devices deployed by Uganda police force and that use AI to confirm a match on the spot, facial and behavior recognition used in Zimbabwe to predict the movements and actions of people in public spaces. So controlling populations, uh, digital bodies and minds is the ultimate postmodern form of biopolitics and there is a tendency to underestimate how converging technologies can be designed uh, to manipulate behaviors for social and political control with corrosive human rights uh, implications. These implications include limits to self-determination and political agency, uh, limits to peaceful assembly and protest, violations of privacy and data protection, discrimination, exposure to pervasive data security breaches, and new forms of censorship uh, in the virtual civic space. So what populations have to face 
increasingly in fragile context are new forms of collective data harms that mm -hmm. can spill over far beyond surveillance to impact and disrupt uh, democracies and elections. So in countries where privacy and data protection policies are not translated into robust operational mechanisms, state and private sector actors can extract sensitive personal data from an array of online population databases for targeting ethnic and socioeconomic groups. And they can exploit citizens' personal profiles and information networks for spreading rumors, targeted propaganda, hate speech, myths, and disinformation. And so, for instance, political campaigns in Kenya in 2017 and in Nigeria in 2015 relied on video propaganda that built on ethnic and socioeconomic tensions to target segments of the electorate defined by ethnicity, political leaning, and age. And such disinformation operations were also built on citizens' fears related to terrorism and public health crisis. Uh, the rationale behind such sophisticated disinformation architecture is to immerse citizens in an alternative virtual reality where they themselves become producers of emotional manipulation. And Jean-Marc mentioned that uh, very eloquently. So interestingly, this tactic muddies uh, who is supposed to carry the burden of intent behind spreading malicious content. And this is what I call the anatomy of information disorders or epistemic conflicts. So in a nutshell, there is a risk to see new power and epistemic asymmetries harming vulnerable populations across societies and borders, and the capacity to manipulate who knows what, who <laughs> feels what, whose vision and survival is empowered, and at what price. These political questions are embodied into the Internet of Bodies and Minds, into the tech convergence uh, that I just described. Now, if I can spare just a few minutes to talk about uh, implications for human dignity, for human dignity in the longer term, I would want to focus on a few more converging and asymmetric trends, and they pertain to the integration of information and life sciences, what I may term the optimization of human and biological life. So in the last two decades, uh, life sciences from biotech, genomics to neurotech have moved from analog to digital, merging with AI as an innovation catalyst. List. And under this convergence, the potential reach of the state and private industry into modern biopolitics, measuring individual and collective biology, neural and genetic profiles, will keep, exp will keep expanding uh, at a very fast pace. So global responses to the COVID-19 pandemic have crystallized just how quickly sensors, algorithms, and computing power can be combined with bio biological data and used in technologies that monitor and optimize public health. In this convergence, uh, genomics and biosciences are becoming not only crucial and sensitive digital assets, but also critical information infrastructure. And these assets will determine the future health, well-being, and social empowerment of populations. Uh, they are strategic not only to biomedicine, but also to biosecurity, medical countermeasures, and the economy. And rising geopolitical tensions already center on the commodification of uh, populations biological and genomic data. So as the collection of genomics and neural data on populations accelerates, there is a greater need to be able to grasp and control the typology of data sets captured and commodified. Because in the longer term, uh, advances in functional genomics, for instance, may lead to potential novel techniques that target infection susceptibilities in specific uh, population subgroups, what the US National Academy calls precision maladies, or applying deep learning to data sets that include neural and behavioral data could lead to insights into modulating our brain biology. Uh, in the future, algorithms and neural devices connected to the, to the internet may allow to track and influence people's mental life with implications for individual agency, the privacy of thoughts and behaviors, and the integrity of cognitive and emotional process. So at the confluence of information and life sciences, we also face increasing risk of adversarial data manipulation, and, and Giacomo mentioned it. And in the absence of solid security measures, AI can be misused to manipulate data sets, creating new insecurity flashpoints and leading to widespread collective data harms. So recently, adversarial attacks on biomedical data, uh, data sets have resulted in manipulation of sensitive information from cancer data in patient CT scans to the DNA sequences of individual genomes. So scientists at Sandia National Labs have shown how autonomous malware uh, could modify fragments of DNA 
DNA sequences within collections of, of genomes. So the attack surface extends far beyond medical diagnosis and clinical trials with adversarial malware that can target the integrity of genomics and other omics data sets related to humans and pathogens. So these threats to population data sets can lead to research and economic sabotage and can compromise governance systems and data integrity crucial to health, food and, and civilian well-being. But in the end, the most damaging impact may be on citizens' capacity and trust, um, capacities, the trust to participate, you know, in these new forms, in these new systems of knowledge and power uh, that are being created. Wow. Thank you so much <laughs> for your attention. Merci, Eleanor. Oh, wow. We just, uh, uh, internet of body and minds, this polarity on uh, the, what is, what can be positively uh, construed uh, or applied for um, areas or opportunities in the space of uh, precision medicine to what can be abused. Um, and so this is now setting us up for a really in very, very provocative discussion. But before we get there, let's talk, uh, let's um, introduce also Professor uh, Tadeo, who will talk about the issues and challenges of human equity. And uh, as I know of you, uh, Professor Tadeo, you'll come in with a philosopher's point of view. There's this intersectionality between philosophy, social science, and this whole area of, of, of human equity and what you, uh, what you observe in your, in your discipline. Thank you, Monique. You shouldn't have now mentioned philosophy because at 3.30 p.m. <laughs> I just want to, to leave at this point. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I promise that uh, it won't be too painful. Uh, <laughs> if you stick around, you might find it enjoying as well. Um, indeed, there is a philosophical premise I should make. Uh, it's not actually a philosophical, it's more a conceptual premise, which is when we talk about um, disruptive technology, transformative technologies, and in particular, when we talk about the digital, um, there are risks and opportunities, and I'm very happy that today the conversation has focused on both sides because usually it's just a strong focus on the risks and we forget about the opportunities, but mm -hmm. there are important opportunities which we have to consider, and some of those we have to make sure we not miss because in missing those opportunities we might be held accountable to future generations. But there is also another more radical transformation, which is the transformation of how we understand the world around us and how we interact with it. Now, this concept of transformation are important because they are, the way we understand the world is what allow us to operate in the world, what allow us to um, rule the world, so to speak, in terms of defining norms and regulations. So uh, this is a, an important background uh, as an assumption, which is, I think, relevant to stress when we think about, for example, um, equity issues or security issues, as it was um, meant, uh, mentioned before, uh, because what it shows us that is that to some extent, the way in which we understand these risks to uh, dignity, to security, even to uh, equity in our societies has shifted a little bit because of the way technology has changed the world around us. Now, delving specifically into the matter of uh, my intervention, there are three kind of um, aspects of human equity that I think are um, under a, quite a bit of stress when it comes to considering digital transformation. The first of, of one I would like to, to focus on is um, the equity of opportunities. So we talk a lot uh, in this world about the digital divide, for example, and from our perspective of people sitting in Geneva, Zurich, New York, Oxford, mm -hmm. is the line between the North and the South. But actually there is a line which divides the access to digital technologies also within our societies. Mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic showed, you know, you might remember a few months ago when the track and tracing apps were starting to be uh, rolled out, uh, we suddenly realized that there are entire portion of our populations that do not know how to install an app on their mobile phones, uh, might not own a smartphone, they don't know how to send an email, upload a picture uh, on the web. So um, just to give uh, um, two data referring to the two communities I belong, the UK and the Italian one, in the UK there are 20, there is 20% 20 of the population who has no, or better, zero digital literacy. In Italy, 32% of the population has no access to the internet. Now, in our societies, the societies, the digital societies, where we depend so much on the digital infrastructure, where the digital technologies are transforming the way in which we interact and understand the world, these chunks of the population are denied opportunities. It's not just the ability of owning the latest smartphones or to do fancy things on social media. It becomes a matter of accessing education, healthcare, uh, information, work, 
So this impact has to be addressed and can only be addressed through forms of governance, which start to look at digital technologies, not so much anymore as totally transformative, totally revolutionary, the technologies of tomorrow, but as the technology of today, and I dare say, to some extent, the technology of yesterday. We are late in that sense. We have to ensure a much more pervasive penetration of these technologies, use of these technologies, if these technologies are to be, as they are, <laughs> an infrastructure of the reality in which we live. The second challenge, the equality challenge that I see there, is an equality of security. Uh, a couple of years ago, Francesca Bosco and I uh, wrote a small uh, article on uh, whether cybersecurity should become or should be considered a common good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's quite trivial if you think about it. Um, the digital infrastructure is something on which we rely for many, many reasons. And I think Jean-Marc and uh, Giacomo identified and mentioned a few important aspects uh, through which uh, attacks and threats can be posed to our societies via the digital. But it's not just the grandiose uh, scenario of state uh, security or big firm and big company security. It, also, it is also um, the security of the small Internet of Things devices, which we might have in our houses, in our offices, in our um, cities. That is also like a vulnerability when we think about that security becomes a cost for companies which develop these devices, a cost which is uh, not um, uh, absorbed by anybody but the customers. And so there is an incentive for uh, producers of these devices to maintain the cost for cybersecurity low, especially because the risk perhaps might be perceived as a little bit not too excessive, uh, not, not too big of a problem if your smart plug-in uh, wall plug um, is attacked, what can happen? The house goes on fire, for example. Uh, so that's a cost that is absorbed by the customer. It's not considered, a state level is not considered as part of um, industrial plans. And this means that people who can afford better and more secure device will do so, and others will pose themselves a liabilities and risks by buying devices which are smart, are interesting, makes life more convenient, but also um, pose a huge or open a huge vulnerabilities in their domestic or office or daily environment, shall we say. Um, the last uh, challenge to um, equality is the one that concerns uh, rights. And I think this is uh, one that is very well known these days. The collection of data, the analysis of data uh, allows us to um, identify categories in the world. And these categories can be put together in different ways. Um, some to drive decisions which are based on some forms of prejudice and bias. Uh, it's not surprising anymore, and this is perhaps the problem when we hear that recruitment processes have been skewed uh, because we used an AI technology which learned about from a data set that only men can get some jobs. So if you're a woman, sorry, we never had that before. We're not going to do that tomorrow. Uh, or when, you know, this becomes some, something that supports healthcare um, or science or, or you name it. Um, it is also something that has to do with specific aspects of technology. If you think about AI and the fact that this technology not only perpetrates biases with respect to the data that is used to train specific models, but it's also non-transparent, so we cannot really inquire how a decision is made. With respect to this point, I'd like to stress one thing, is that we've had so far, perhaps, <laughs> the wrong approach. We have thought that the way to ensure that bias or discriminations or rights are not breached is to develop um, from the start ethical um, pieces of technologies, AI which is more biased, um, AI which is more transparent. I think this is an approach that works only in part because we are talking about technologies which adapt with the environment and revise themselves and refine their behavior with respect to the environment. So it's the moment in which uh, has arrived in which we understand that we have to shift the focus from developing ethical technology, so to speak, to have governance approaches, auditing, for example, to keep this technology in check as it works. And so this takes me to the last point uh, of my um, intervention here. Uh, going back to the premise, these technologies are redesigning the way, the way in which we interact with the world, but also the way in which we understand the world. Now, so far, we talk about the digital as if the digital broadly understood was or is a transformative technology. It is true, but looking at it, at some point, the digital will become a mature technology. We will not have 
I hope so, another conference on the ethics of AI in 15 years talking about bias. However, when the fact that it stops being mature does it not mean that it stops working. It just means that it goes into the background. We're planting today the seeds for a technology which will mature tomorrow. And we're planting today the seeds of a technology which shapes the reality in which we live and in which we are going to live and our next generations are going to live. So it is important that we start today thinking about not only how we use this technology or how we design this technology, but how also how we create a normative assets or a normative structures around the technology to make sure that it goes on the right path as it evolves, uh, so that we stop perhaps arriving a little bit late and can we and can we and we can start um, uh, orienting the development and the use of these new um, these new uh, technologies before before their impact becomes a kind of hard written in our reality, uh, and that will be too hard to change the path. And I'll stop you. Oh, well, well, don't stop now because we're just going to start into our questions and answers. I know that we have a question from the uh, uh, from the audience, but before I get to the question from the audience, I have a few questions myself. And, um, you know, some of them uh, I've sort of uh, aggregated in while you were speaking. One of them is, you know, just the just the, just leaving it up, uh, Maria Rosario. You know, on the questions about ethics, there is this whole uh, notion about the. Uh, I know there's a book that's been written. It's the ethical algorithm. Um, you know, sort of the science of socially uh, aware algorithmic design, and that's uh, written by Michael Kearns and, and Aaron Roth. I mean, there they're talking about differential privacy. And I think that ethics component is is part of uh, some of the discussions, uh, some of the themes that I picked out, plus this whole notion of differential, pri this whole notion of privacy or privacy. So my question to, and each one of you can come and hop hop in because this is an, our na our natural discussion. Is privacy dead? No, that was a bad statement that someone mentioned. Uh, uh, a yeah. few days ago. Privacy is not dead because privacy is a right that protects our dignity. And our dignity is not that, cannot be that, should not be that. Um, I think that privacy, however, uh, as many other rights, um, uh, needs to be re not redefined, but we could extend or expand our understanding of privacy to make sure that we are protected in a better way from the risks that digital technology poses to us. I'll give you an example. Um, we talk about privacy in terms of individual privacy, so protect mm -hmm. my, my identity. But when you look at big data or AI or statistic analysis, it's not really the identity of people that is a risk. It's much yeah. more the grouping of people. My, my privacy is not a risk because I'm Maria Rosaria and I like some kind of music or some kind of food. It's because I fit quite well, perhaps, in some categories, which might be put together and lead to some kind of discrimination. So perhaps we have to start thinking about um, something that Luciano Florida, a colleague of mine here in Oxford, calls the group privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we can protect those rights. So I don't think it's so much a matter of saying that privacy is dead, uh, and I wouldn't like to live in a world where that's the case, uh, but I think it's a matter of understanding how can we redefine, re-understand uh, the concept of privacy to the challenges that reality poses to us. Well, so let me take this a little bit further. Um, so uh, we've heard of this convergence of, of, of the technologies around the human, you know, how, how this looks for the, for, for the human itself. Um, I know Jean-Marc, uh, and particularly Jean-Marc and Eleanor, you've actually kind of uh, framed it up in a dish Giacomo, uh, what this means in terms of the, uh, this whole notion of the hu internet of bodies and minds and you know how we're thinking, how the brains are, our, our brain is interacting. But my, uh, I think the, the int interest here is this polarity. I see this polarity between good, uh, the, positive or tech for, for what I'll call tech for good or positive use and the potential for abuse. And we tend to think about uh, that sort of the dystopian view here. So my concern, my concern, my, the question I have immediately is when we're into brain to brain interfaces, uh, brain, understanding the brain itself, uh, I wanna take this, this, uh, this question a step further. Um, can my brain be hacked? That's for you, Eleanor. I <laughs> set it up for you. <laughs> Thank you and then so followed by you, followed by you, Giacomo. Come on in. This is this is a great discussion here. Yes. 
so, I mean, at present days, uh, I wouldn't say that's necessarily possible, but the te technologies are developing towards uh, that, uh, that trend. So the idea that you could monitor brain activity, but then increasingly also by monitoring, monitoring that activity, understanding the underlying processes uh, behind uh, decision making, behind emotional and cognitive processes, attention uh, processes, all of that is something that is, that's, uh, that's being developed uh, further and tested, for example, on animals already uh, in, in some trials. Um, so what we need to think about is really, you know, this new, this, this typology of, 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 it's more than data sets, it's really uh, the human experience that we mm -hmm. are categorizing, uh, collecting, um, analyzing, you know, with, with also prejudices and with different type of, uh, of, of perspective we, we are coming from. Another point that's really important and made by uh, everyone today, it's this notion of collective data harms. So increasingly, uh, privacy as an individual dimension or individual consent is meaningless if the harm is collective. Uh, and so it's almost like thinking about, you know, climate change. It's more of a, it's a personal and societal threat uh, and it's, uh, it's in, in a collective dimension. So how do we rethink uh, data governance in a way that can um, tackle that collective dimension uh, that can allow for, uh, you know, thinking about neural rights, for example, rights about neural data. Uh, those could be uh, thought uh, in, in a way that's close to how we protect organs donation or different type of donation that are, you know, made of very intimate um, and, 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 and life related uh, uh, elements. So, you know, the, the, how do we how do we uh, create a governance system that maybe is based on on the form of data trust, a collective system where it's not just on me the burden of knowing how I how I manage uh, my own data and these of my community, but how that can be, uh, you know a choice and a, and a design made by collective guardians, kind of, you know, re-giving the possibility of, of collective empowerment here. Um, I, I also like what Maria Rosa said about the change in how we perceive the world, something that we will need to understand, and that's that was not really mentioned today because we're talking about humans. It's not only about humans, it's also about non-humans, pathogens, the, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the ecosystem we are dealing with. Those data are also important and those dynamics are also at risk or some of those uh, data sets are, are also at risk to some extent. And so um, when we think about this new symbiosis where our human condition is optimized, what does that mean to optimize also, you know, in relation to other species, this symbiosis concept? How can we shape it towards good? Because there is good that can happen, you know, in the medical domain, in, uh, in, in the education domain. But, but how do we shape it with a human and biology centric, um, you know, yep. perspective? Okay, Giacomo, yeah, I think you had uh, uh, an inter uh, you wanted to, part you know, uh, yeah, sure. add some points here. Yeah, and then Jean-Marc, I'm going to go to you for a specific question. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to try to answer your question. Can can your brain be be hacked? And uh, um, I, I think the, the the short answer is is yes. Uh, and I would say, in a way, it it already it already is. Although in in a soft way, if you think about how uh, AI and algorithms have been shaping your choices uh, based you know based on what you see, what they think that you want to see. So it's a kind of a soft hacking, but uh, if by hacking you mean um, influencing your choices and behaviors and actions, you could argue that in a way technology is already there. What is where it's still going is the development of bidirectional uh, brain machine interfaces. So right now the technology is definitely more mature, you know, kind of unidirectional, so from the brain to the machine. But there are, you know, there is kind of a growing body of research that is looking at how can machines and, and, and devices kind of communicate back to the brain. And of course, that opens up a whole new range of positive uh, applications, but at the same time, a whole new set of risks. And when it comes to the, the, the issue that you mentioned about uh, privacy, I think that there is one trend that we I'd like to highlight here, which is the uh, increased kind of a, a, a notion of like digital identity and digital twins of each physical person, if you if you want, uh, more and more uh, uh, 
uh, information is gathered, of course, uh, uh, and data is gathered uh, around us. But we are we're looking at a future where um, some of this, some of the real life and physical world uh, services and accesses and applications, for example, for authentication, for access control, for payment, might be based on on digital versions of ourselves. So uh, the in order for that to, to happen, in, you know, the whole concept of privacy would have to be rethought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I note that we, um, we have uh, a few minutes left here. So what I'm going to do is um, allow Jean-Marc to actually uh, provide a comment uh, from, uh, from, from the floor here, our audience, with regard to this whole notion about uh, the possibility of having a cyber uh, peace treaty or not, or whether or not that could uh, even be enforceable, what would be required. I'm going to, so Jean-Marc, if you can just uh, in two minutes comment to that, and then I'm going to go to lightning round for all of you. Well, at the end of the day, a treaty is an aggregation of agreements of uh, the parties, part of the, the treaty, and uh, it has to reflect common interest. And what we've seen so far is that uh, uh, we don't have an agreement on how, for instance, uh, the internet or cyber uh, should work. And what we've seen now is that there is increased polarization because uh, great powers have understood that norm setting uh, is the first step to build up a world that is similar to, 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 to your worldview. So uh, there are lots of obstacles on, uh, on the way, not talking about uh, the issues that deal with attribution, uh, for instance, the fact that you can hide uh, your, your your activities. So yes, there has there, there has been talks. Uh, there have been improvement. The problem is that you faced with uh, um, uh, real uh, uh, politics. But beyond that, what is also uh, important to note is that we talk about governance and. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at what happened in AI, we need to have standards, we need to develop uh, norms. But for instance, in AI, we've seen the opposite. We've seen a proliferation of norms and initiatives, and now you have too many of them. So I think we should go for a smart uh, governance where we really try to get on board all the, uh, the, the, the stakeholders to solve this problem, because what uh, this this technology is this development leads to is actually the fusion between the machine and human being and this no matter from which country you are from this should affect all of us because it will affect the way we think about what human being is uh, in uh, in the future and, and i think that um, although for some people that could be seen as sci-fi i think um, as uh, Maya rosario said uh, we need to think about uh, about these issues now even though they are not the, the technology is not yet mature we need some foresight in order to uh, develop um, frameworks, normative frameworks that will prevent uh, things from going uh, badly. Wonderful. So now, listen, um, this has been a, a great discussion. We have been discussing the emerging uh, and disruptive technologies and how they can, let's say, um, impact our cyberspace uh, peace and vulnerable populations. This is now the lightning round. And how would you, each of you, uh, have a call to action in two sentences. In two sentences, we'll start with you, uh, Jean-Marc, and then we'll go right down the path, uh, the order we had. Jean-Marc, two sentences. Call sure, to just, what, just what I said. Uh, so think about smart governance and uh, invest in into knowledge, into foresight, and develop uh, uh, in favor polymath thinking. So people that are able to grasp different uh, topics, different fields, so that they could get a, uh, a big picture. Giacomo. Yeah, uh, everything Jean-Marc said, plus uh, my two sentences would be um, uh, really, uh, start to grasp with the idea and the concept that as digital technologies are permeating our societies, individuals become part of the, of the response of the problem. So human security has to be uh, uh, considered as an uh, uh, individual responsibility as well. And linked to that, the issue of investing in uh, education um, and uh, uh, awareness raising of, of how to be a responsible digital citizen. Okay, grazie. Eleanor. 
Yeah, so I would say I would say on perspective, um, you know, thinking about that new biopolitics uh, model I talked about, if, and and everybody talked about that fusion of uh, of uh, of data and behaviors and what it means to be human, connecting that with the microbiocene, the life, the the world around us. How do we, uh, you know, integrate uh, those data also and those risks and opportunities, and two methods for for thinking about these four sites. You know, everybody mentioned it across tech and across sectors, public and private but also a form of normative foresight where you have a theory of no harm when it comes to population data sets and critical uh, information infrastructure. And last but not least, Maria Rosaria. Thank you. I think the two points would be uh, to protect innovation by protecting human ingenuity, innovation, imagination, uh, to make sure that we can you know, keep progressing on that side, but also uh, regulate innovation with stewardship, to steer it, so to make sure that today's innovation and tomorrow's innovation will respect the fundamental values of our societies. Thank you, my fellow panelists, for a wonderful discussion, uh, and to the Cyber Peace Institute, Cyber Peace Lab, for framing this discussion up. I feel that we are just at the tip of the iceberg, so I am sure and positive there will be a continuation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.